hit him, he's dropped on the floor. His mate's jumped up and hit me, I've hit his mate. An hour later, the police had come to the student apartment or wherever it was that was staying at student house accommodation and arrested. Everyone was there. We all got locked up. So they basically, they remanded me and sent me to jail on a section 18. So then I was like, okay. Then when I was in jail, he died. He passed away while I was in jail. A couple of days later, the police come back to the jail, they took me back to the police station, re-interviewed me, charged me with murder. So welcome Ty and welcome back everybody to turning your adversity into an asset. And uh, today I have another man who has in fact turned his adversity into an asset. You might see a theme running throughout these podcast episodes. But today, and a very, very interesting story, something that I think is going to hit home with a lot of people, you know, something in some respects I can relate to, although maybe not to the depths that you've been. And of course your story. So that's, that's what we're here to talk about you and your story, but what, you know, how you've been able to turn that around and the lifestyle you're living today. So let's start off, you know, at the beginning before, you know, before the adversity struck, uh, tell me a little bit about what your life was like and, uh, you know, how things were for you then. So yeah, for, if you strip it back from the start, I grew up in a little village in Derby with, um, my mother, my older sister, my older brother, and then a few years later, my little brother. Um, and I guess I had a normal-ish childhood. Um, we grew up in a village, countryside, very no crime. All the kids played down the street together. We was definitely poor. We grew up in a council house. My mum was a single mother of four. Um, so we was definitely quite on the lower side of things. But we got we got everything we needed. There was food, there was um everything we needed and stuff but we obviously didn't have the best of everything and then yeah when I was around 10 years old I moved to my father's house with my father and my stepmom and I lived there um until I was an adult really went to school secondary school a very quite a posh secondary school but yeah I think I didn't um I never really fitted in I guess growing up I was a predominantly white area where I grew up <clears throat> being the countryside little villages and stuff um, but I didn't really experience no racism growing up. I know I was different. There's a little bit, but I like hardly anything. Like I was quite blessed. I didn't really mm. um, suffer any like real racism because there's a lot of places where there's still a lot of racism going on and bad things. But I was luckily I was um, I grew up in an area where I didn't whether or not people thought it. I never really they never said it. Do you know mm. what I mean? So. Um, and then, yeah, I just boxed my whole life. I was boxing from the age of seven, grew up boxing in the um, boxing, doing amateur boxing and stuff. What, a, what got you into boxing? How did that happen? Yeah, so my dad, he was a boxer. Okay. So when I was, my dad was a boxer, obviously, before I was born. Um, he retired when I was seven and opened up his own boxing gym. And from then, I just grew up in the gym. Okay. Love-hate relationship with boxing. Um, still is to this day. Mm. Um, what makes you love it and hate it? I don't like training. I hate it. Just, just, just something I've never really liked. Um, I like the fighting. I like sparring. I like doing pads, but I just don't like the training. I don't like running. I don't like dieting. And I've given my life to boxing. I've got not a great deal back, even though it's opened a lot of doors for me. But boxing per se itself inside the ring, I've not really got a lot from it yet. It's looking like it's just about to start building up and hopefully start to get paid out from it. But through some of it was my own doing, um, but a lot of it was I'm quite bitter towards the boxing board in some respects. Mm. But yeah, that was basically my childhood life before so, growing so up. Did you feel like you was kind of forced into it a little bit by your dad, and and that just sort of the path that you took because he told you to kind of thing? Or? Yeah, so my dad never told me to box. I just okay. did it because I wanted to do it, um, but I, I was never forced into it. I just did it, but I did it. It, just, it was just like a natural progression. Like I was just in the gym, and I had a natural talent for it. I'm I'm naturally very talented at boxing, but I don't work hard, so that balances it out. If uh -huh. I worked very hard, I'd have been a far better boxer than I am mm. because I just rely on my talent. I don't like training and stuff. It gives everyone else an opportunity to mm. be better than me or, or or equal to me. Whereas in another world, if I actually trained hard, I wouldn't even be in the same league. Mm. It's interesting because there's a lot of boxers that have boxer parents, aren't there? Yeah. Um, even Charlie Edwards, who I don't know if you know, he's he on the friend, podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, his dad literally beasted him and, yeah. uh, from the ages of probably similar age to you, but forced him into it after school. He was doing like five hour trainings and yeah. he was like, you're going to become a world champion. He's very grateful for now, but it was like torture at the time. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure there's many other stories, many other people. Very, yeah, very similar. it does. It's, it happens a lot in boxing, yeah. So you got into boxing and you started to make a bit of progress, right? As you were getting a little bit older into your teens. 
Yeah, I'll say, to be honest with you, if I'm being honest, I had a lot. I had some um, progress and then back for so I was my own worst enemy. Like, I'd do well and then I just wouldn't train and then fight and then lose and then do well and just psyche off, fight and lose. So it was, I was my own, even started, even when I was 18, I turned pro and I was just the same. Like, I would train, win a few fights, then go out partying, mm. try and fight and then get knackered after one round and lose and stuff like that. So it wasn't... Um, like I said, I had all the talent in the world, just not the work ethic. And the yeah. thing is, in boxing, hard work will always beat talent if talent doesn't work hard. So mm. I was a, uh, I was definitely. Well, that's fair play for you for admitting that. Yeah, it's but true. you got to pro, so that's that's a good status. And and I believe at one point, um, there was you know some headlines that you was going to become like the ne this next up and coming British yeah. champion. Where, where 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 was that coming from? And um, I think that come. Well, there was a lot of promise. Like people would see me box and they'd see the talent. They'd think this, but they'd see like <clears throat> they'd also see like I was only talented for a couple of rounds. Then I'd deplete, and then he could see like you can have all the talent in the world. This mm. isn't a one round fight. There's no point having a um, the fastest horse in the world if it can only do one hurdle. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? And then there's no, there's no point. There's, so there was all basically saying if this geezer gets his act together, he will yeah. be the it will be the next best thing. But uh, then adversity struck, I went away. Yeah. Um, Before we get onto that, because that's obviously a very interesting thing. Why do you think that you were so half in it? You know, when you had all this talent and promise and people were saying that you could be this next big thing and you, you got all this talent and you knew you got this talent, but you weren't obviously giving it your all. What, what was stopping you from like, you know, going, do you know what? I'm going to build my stamina. I'm going to reach my full potential. I'm going to, I'm going to make this thing work. Two reasons. Um, one, I was quite young at the time so I wasn't thinking about like I was comfortable like I was young I lived at home with my parents didn't have to pay no bills I didn't have no I didn't have no dry I didn't need to go out there and make it because I was living a fine life I just wanted mm. to go out I, I felt like I was missing out with all I was young I wanted to be around birds I wanted to be in clubs mm. I was it was all new it was exciting and being a professional boxer I guess it's kind of like you've, you've made it already yeah yeah that, <laughs> the, 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 being a professional boxer you can't do none of that like you mm. can't go out to the clubs you can't you have to right. eke in so that's what it was and also boxing's never really been my passion it's just something I'm good at because if someone says to me you never get paid from boxing I wouldn't do it and they always say a passion is something you do regardless if you're getting paid or not yeah and I wouldn't box if I didn't get paid. So it's not my passion. So it's hard to do something. It's hard. You have to give your life to boxing. It's hard to give your life to something you don't have a passion for. I do want to don't have a passion for it. I don't have a passion for it per se, but I have a passion for the feeling it gives me when I win. And it's not just thinking, oh yeah, like he's the best boxer. It's like making my family proud, mm -hmm. things like that. Course, yeah. Or feeling like a sense of accomplishment. All the people that told me I'd never make something of myself. Look, look now. Mm -hmm. That that I have a passion for, but everything else that comes with it, I didn't have a passion for. So it was a bit of sweet. It was like up and down for me. It was, right. it was hard sometimes, especially when you've got to get out of your bed at six in the morning and go running in the cold for something that you don't even like anyway. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Was so, your dad putting any pressure on you at this point? Nah, not really. He did he did, and he didn't. It wasn't so harsh like you have to do it, but it was like, there's no point. He, he, he was basically telling me to pack up a lot of times. Like, you're just going to make a fool of yourself. Right. If you're going to do it, do it or don't do it. That's basically how he was. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah. So tell us about this uh, story of going away, you know, and I guess what completely, you know, threw yeah. a spanner in the works. What happened, you know, tell, tell us as much detail as possible because I think this is probably, you know, the most interesting part of this how one. you've been able to go from a professional boxer to where you are now. Yeah. Very surprising that there's this big chunk in the middle. Yeah. Um, to us hear about it. So I was 19, I think, and I was um, out with a friend in Leeds on a night out. I think it was like a student night or something. Um, and we'd gone out with a few, like a few of his friends that he'd met up there, like some of his uni friends, because there was all a uni up there. We'd, long story short, basically, we'd gone out after his friend had been arguing with another guy in the takeaway or outside the subway. Oh, the, it's, it's always subway. Always subway. Always subway. <laughs> subway. So there's arguing outside subway or whatever. I didn't I didn't know him and I didn't know the guy was arguing with. It was nothing to do with me. I went inside, was eating my food or whatever. Then these lot have come in there, they're still arguing. Then this guy's rang his mates. So now there's like a few of his mates have come. So then this guy's with us. So then everyone's like spilled out and gone outside. These two are going around the corner for a one-on-one. -on -one. The guy that was with us got battered by this other guy. This guy battered him, punched him all up and down the road. 
And then I, I can't remember how or what was said because I remember trying to stop it before it happened. Like all the witnesses were there, was like, look, stop. Like I was like, listen, it's over nothing. Like don't fight, like let's go. But they didn't listen, they ended up fighting. And then the guy that was with our group got battered. And then me and this other guy ended up in a verbal altercation, the guy that beat him up. So we're arguing back and forth. Then he's basically saying, I'm going to wash my hand because he must have cut his hand when he was beating up the guy. He's like, I'm going to wash your hand, I'm going to come back. I'm going to knock you out. I was like, all right, mate, sound. So then we've walked off, tried to get in the taxi, but the taxi driver's not letting us in because this geezer's covered in blood because he's just been battered. So I've walked around the corner and this guy's there again. So the meaning of like, as I've come around the corner, meaning I've come face to face. Words have been said and we've ended up like step taking a step towards each other at the same time. So we've basically gone for each other at the same time. I've hit him, he's dropped on the floor. His mate's jumped up and hit me. I've hit his mate. Turned around, got in the taxi, left. That was it. Um, about an hour later, the police had come to the student student apartment or wherever it was that was staying at student house accommodation and arrested. Everyone was there, locked us all up. I didn't really think nothing of it. I thought, like, he's a fight. He's battered him. He's me and him have gone for each other. His mate's hit me, I've hit his mate back, etc. Have you had fights like this before? Yeah. Is this, like, quite a common thing to no, be so, scarf after a night out? Yeah, no, so... I had, I've had, I'd had plenty of fights before, street fights and stuff before. I would never start them, but I wouldn't walk away. That yeah. was always my thing. I don't care if there's one or 10. I'd been done before because I was fighting like 10 people. I'm not going to, I had a real thing. I was very insecure. I didn't know this till I got older, but I was very insecure. So I didn't understand certain things mm. and why I felt insecure and stuff. So whether or not there's one person or a hundred people, I'm going to fight. Regardless, if I get beat mm. up, I get beat up. Is what it is, isn't it? Did you ever get charged, or was it just you got away with it? Um, I got charged with a few, nothing major, like common assault or like public order offences and stuff. Um, so yeah, so we all got locked up. But I've been locked up before. Normally, within twenty four hours, you're out. Mm. I'd been in there a day. I was in there another day. I was thinking, there's something not right here. They come, they took all my fingernails, this, that. Then they basically said the guy's on a life support machine and he's not getting enough oxygen to his brain. So I'm thinking, I'm starting to get worried because nothing like this has ever happened before. So they basically, they remanded me and sent me to jail wow. on a section 18. So then I was like, okay. Then when I was in jail, he died. He passed away while I was in jail. So how did you find out about that? So it was quite hard because I spoke to my family like while I'd been in there a day or two. And it was like, he's getting better. Like he's, he's, he's recovering and stuff. He's like okay now then one day i'd rang my mom like the next day or the day after she was crying i said what are you crying for she's like oh he's dead i said who's dead she goes the guy's dead i said what i thought he was fine like so then like selfishly i just remember thinking i'm never gonna get out of jail now like i'm in this cell and i'm probably never coming out now this is my life done now do you know what i mean because i'm thinking like oh he's right. died like people when people kill people they go to jail forever especially when you're 19 you ever yeah you don't really understand the laws and stuff so i was just like stressed like Selfishly, I just thought about myself. A couple of days later, the police come back to the jail. They told me back to the police station, re-interviewed me, charged me with murder and uh, an ABH on his friend. Because his friend, his friend hit me, I hit his friend back. Yeah, so then I had to go on. But before the trial, they found out that um, there was a lot of negligence at the hospital, which obviously we didn't know before. So basically, when he went to hospital, he actually had no life-threatening injuries. He would he had a bleed on the brain, but they didn't class it as life-threatening. But what they'd done is when they um, took him to the hospital, they incubated him. So they put him, they cut off his breathing and put them on their own breathing machine. But the breathing machine they put him on didn't work. So they've left him and the machine was starving his brain of oxygen and his body went into cardiac arrest. So then they've... And his one of his lungs collapsed. So then they've like tried to reinflate his lung, but then punctured his lung by trying to inflate it. I don't know, but basically they punctured his lung by putting it something right next to his heart, like a tube to try and reinflate it. They were just blunder after blunder after blunder. So I was like, you've charged me with murder, but the cause of death wasn't me. And he had no life threatening injuries until he went to hospital. So how am I going to then get done for murder? So they was like, if you never put him in hospital, he wouldn't have been subject to the negligence from the hospital. So you're both guilty kind of thing you both at fault so I was like so before the child was offering me manslaughter or section 18 I said I'm not doing I'm not taking guilt I'm not pleading to section 18 because there's no intent it was one punch it's not mm -hmm. like I hit him stamped him out kept beating. just just for everybody that's listening uh section 18 is GBH with Within the intent to, to cause it so you're like you yeah. meant to yeah, you're meant cause, to cause previous bodily, bodily harm, harm yeah which is wounding and inflicting I think yeah so it's yeah, like yeah. either stabbing someone or breaking yeah. their bones yeah, or, or going, something yeah, serious and yeah, it's like meaning to do it yeah so there's, they offer you that or manslaughter yeah so okay. manslaughter they said there was no intent to cause serious harm but someone's lost a life i'm that's, saying that's I, a bit of a toss-up because they could both be probably just as bad in yeah. a sense because like, section, 18, you section 18 i'd have actually got longer right because yeah. i've been charged of 18 before. yeah section 18 i would have probably got longer than a manslaughter but i said look 
I'll please to go to section 20. Uh, and just for everybody listening again, manslaughter is when you accidentally kill somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which could be anything from pushing somebody over. Yeah. You know, or... Sometimes people get manslaughter for stabbing people, weirdly enough. I don't know how, but they do. But I said, look, I'll please go to section 20, which is GBH without intent, yeah. um, because I, there was no intent there and I didn't kill him. They said no. They said you can either have manslaughter... Or section eighteen. I can already guess what their where, what their uh, argument was that you're a pro boxer and that you had weapons. Yeah, they tried to use that, but they can't in law use it. They tried to use it, but legally they can't. Legally, whether you're a boxer or not, even if an old man hits you, legally you're allowed to hit him back. So my my because my defense was it was self defense. He come at me, I went at him. It, at the time I at the time I was saying he come to me, which he did come to me. But obviously we came in hindsight we went at each other. But I'm saying, look, if you never come to me first. I wouldn't have gone to him. So I said, so yeah, they, they couldn't even use your hands as weapons because I was saying I was it was self-defense. But I said, I'm not pleading guilty to them, so I'll go to trial and murder then. So they said, all right, let's go to trial and murder. So I so went. So you, you was going, I want to get out, no no charges. No, no, no. Trial. I said, I'll plead guilty to section 20. So right, which okay. means GBH no intent. Right, okay. So it's still, a, it's still a prison sentence. But they said, no. So I said, okay, we'll go to trial and murder then. They said, are you sure? I said, yeah, we'll go to trial and murder. I went to trial and murder. Got found guilty of manslaughter and they gave me seven and a half years with a th three years extended license. I was on license for like seven years when I came out. I ended up serving just under four years, mm -hmm. about a month shy of four years because I ended up doing extra days for phones and stuff. Yeah, so look, I'm a bit conflicted on this one because at the end of the day, someone's lost their life, right? Which we're, we're going to talk about. And yeah. we, know, we need to acknowledge that's, you know, you can't get anything worse than the outcome Fact. that's created that. Yeah. However, and no however, but also you're a 19-year-old lad, right, who's throwing a punch outside Subway. You won't be the first, you won't be the last. That happens a lot. Unfortunately, this guy's lost his life and you've been given an eight-year prison sentence. Now, I think that's quite a lengthy prison sentence, especially for your first time in jail, I'm assuming, right? Uh, your first proper sentence, I'd been remanded and stuff before I got... Um, like a couple of week sentence for like not doing my tag and stuff like that when I was younger. But yeah, that was my first, you're going to prison for this year. How was your demeanor when you was in trial? Did you put on a suit? Did you, yeah. like, cause it, yeah. did you try to play the part? Because yeah, yeah, it, I, was, I know I was, a guy that, that went to prison for murder for punching someone actually. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. He was um, 17 years old and um, he got in an argument with someone walking down the street. Oh, I met him in jail. What was his name? Um... Bradley? No. Was he a boxer? No, no, oh, no. okay. I remember his name. Yeah, sorry, I just thought it might have been the same. Yeah, oh, God, I wish I could remember him. I had, had these seizures and it's wiped a bit of my memory. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, he was a really, really nice lad. He's like mid-20s now, of course. But he, um, he, he saw this guy down the street. They had a bit of an argument and uh, punched him once. And uh, the guy didn't even, I think he got up and, you know, he fell down, got up, walked off. And, uh, but because he was 17 years old, he had a black eye and he went to the, the old Bailey in London and he was wearing a tracksuit and he was basically like just giving it full attitude because yeah. he just didn't understand what situation he was in. The court just made an, an, an example of him and I think they gave him 14 year life sentence. So it was a minimum of 14 yeah, and yeah. then... It might have been slightly less. I think it was maybe 11, actually. 11 minimum, but then he's obviously got yeah, a life yeah, of parole. Yeah, of course. They've ruined his life. Uh, he's obviously taken someone else's life. So, look, you know, I, I don't want to get stick. <laughs> you know, from yeah. everyone going, well, look, look at Lewis trying to defend people that kill people. But there's one thing taking a life and there's one thing taking someone else's life through the punishment that's given. Now, I know that particularly this guy did not mean to kill anybody. And I know he was a really nice guy. And I know that his life was taken away you know he's not going to get out of prison probably until he's 30 yeah. some of the things he was you know saying to me he was like crazy you know he'd never even experienced facebook and mm -hmm. didn't even know about dressing or going out and just it's just like, like he's missing the best parts of his life how do you feel about an eight-year prison sentence at, at the time at the time i thought it was very harsh for the simple fact is people for the same crime was getting once in two years actually the guy that literally just got sentenced before me it was his second manslaughter and he got three years and he hit someone with a bat so i was like i've hit somebody once with a fist i didn't kill him the hospital did and you're going to give me eight years so mm. i was very bitter and annoyed at the time i didn't show it i was just like all right cool i'm very good at taking bad news like um or taking setbacks in life i'll just take it on the chin like it is what it is but i remember thinking 
he just tried to make an example out of me. I appealed it. They said, no chance. Go like deep. So I was like, I accepted it and like, it is what it is. Do yeah. your sentence. Since I've come out, um, I think I got what I deserved. I'm glad they give me that long. I think, right. I think that it's, my parents could come and see me in prison. My parents, I'm with them now. I can have a son, this and that. His family don't get that. So what is four years in jail mm. in comparison? And I think, I think even though it's a freak accident and it's a mistake, people need to get longer in jail right. for it. I think that they should make the laws on, because one, one punch one law is very common. It's a lot more common than people think. And it'll make people stop punching stop people, pooping people yeah. in the town. Yeah, because what is it in comparison? Like people are getting two, three years for it before. That's nothing compared to you've taken somebody's family member away from them. Mm. That's what's a couple of years in jail. It should be a lot longer. You should be getting 10 years in jail for it. Yeah, I'm an advocate to make it longer, if anything. I'm glad wow. that I got my sentence. And I think if they did give me, I think I'd have changed anyway. I think the whole ex, the whole, the whole thing changed me as a person anyway. But I just think I, it gave me even longer to mature. I think I wasn't really, I didn't really mature till I got older, a bit older. I think I was quite young at the time. And I think getting such a long sentence com in comparison to what I thought I was getting, it kind of shot me and put me in my place and just thought, yeah, like if you, like I've never got in trouble again, never been arrested since. So what was it like when you first got into the young offenders institution, you were 19 and you, you know, you're there for manslaughter, you know, that's a murder. Yeah. So in the first got there, it was in, murder. The, in, in the eyes of, you know, young offenders, you know, that's up the ranks. You know, yeah. Some people don't understand. That's a good thing. Yeah. Which is yeah. fucking Mad crazy. Yeah. But like, what are you in for? This is the first yeah, thing you yeah. get asked. And when you say oh, RM, you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, bang, yeah. you're straight at the top. How did, how did you react to that sort of new role identity i'm like a chameleon i can fit in, in any surroundings so i could be in a dangerous prison and be absolutely fine and fit in and i can be at a board meeting with posh millionaires and fit in mm. i went to a posh school a very well to do school i'm from a very posh area but i can also go to the most ghetto places you've ever been and fit in so i'm, I'm just i just adapt to my surroundings a lot of the time but i'm a very um i spend most of my time by myself i'm a real loner like i'm a the definition, the definition of a popular loner. Like I've got a lot of people around me, a lot of friends, this and that, but I'm by myself a lot of the time. And even before I went to jail, I was always in my room a lot of the time anyway. So mm. sitting in a cell all day, every day, 23 hours a day was nothing to me. I didn't even mind it. And it's mad to say I had some of the most peaceful times in my life in prison. Well, that's crazy you say that because I say that mm. and I thought I was the only one that kind of had that. And yeah, just... very peaceful, man. You've got no, like you got, you're not worrying about making money, keeping up with the Joneses, got to provide, but do all these things. Yeah. I was just like, I've got no responsibilities. I'm just in this cell. No one even like, even though your friends and your family love you, outside and out of mind, you're basically dead anyway. You're just like, you're just like in a concrete tomb. It's like a big, it's like a big coffin. You, and I was always by myself at a single cell. I was just there by myself. Mm. And I was just there just chilling. Like I'm very, very comfortable in my own, by myself. Because what people don't realise is when, unless you get moved to a C cat, you know, A or B, you know, you're you're banged up twenty three hours a day. Yeah. And uh, when you are banged up, um, when they when they lock that door, you're, you're safe. You know. Yeah. A lot of people worry. Well, how can you be feeling like peaceful in prison? Well, you're locked. You know, no yeah. one's getting in there. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like you said, there's nothing to think or do or be. Everyone's laying out your agenda. You just got to follow the orders. Everything's paid for. And, and it is peaceful and it gives you time to think and reflect and, and like you said, actually have an opportunity to mature. And that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons why I guess, you know, you think people should get longer. And I completely, I guess, agree with that. The only sort of counter argument I have and why I, I do w worry about that kind of l lengthy sentence for a lot of people is I think it's very rare that there's someone like you that's come out of the other side and has changed and has been able to build a life for themselves, which we're going to come on to in a minute because as you as you'll know majority of people reoffend. yeah and when you've got you know manslaughter conviction over your head and you spend four years around those people in jail you can't help but be a chameleon and adapt yeah. and absorb and start to become those people 100%. and you also start to lose touch of what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is bad and you know jail 100%. time is no longer a thing like Facts. when i came out after doing a you know, young offenders, just just three months. I was like, oh shit, my crime's a little and my yeah. sen sentence was little. I need to get a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually my mindset. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I even remember coming out when I was 25 and, you know, just, just dressing differently and talking differently and 
like it becomes part of you to a certain extent. Yeah. And I can understand why people not want to go back, but are comfortable to go back and happy to put themselves in situations where they're going to go back because it becomes part of right who there. they are. 100%. So that, that's the danger of sending someone that's a professional boxer, got a lot of talent, you know, potentially bright future ahead of him, but then locks him away for four years and, you know, gets tarnished with this, you know, manslaughter identity mm. and gets put around people that are going to, um, extract the worst out of you and all the goodness of you is never going to be allowed to get out because yeah. there's not an environment to it's a very fine that. line it's true it's 100 percent true i agree i think you have to be careful on because it's prison because they, they always say prison is the punishment you know i'm meant to get punished in prison that's what these that's what they preach but they don't really help no one in prison they just put you in there and there's so many people with um there's so many talented people in prison man that have mm. just got the they could do something good with their life i think with me like I'm lucky like I've never been in trouble with the law since, but I'm very lucky and blessed to have the family I do and the friends I do. Like a lot of people don't have that. So I can only judge myself from my point of view. And I think for me personally, I'm lucky that I have that. I, if I never had what I have, then maybe I could have been a different person. I might have been in and out of prison my whole life, but I've got a very family that love me, a very big family. They love me, they care about me and they want to see me do better. And I have a responsibility to try and right my wrongs. Mm. Um, so it's hard because you think everybody needs a different, you can have two people with the exact same crime and a different, and a different time slot can benefit one or not the other. So it's, it's how do you judge it? So you've got to, it's, everything is on individual merit, but the judges don't really care about people's background. They look at the crime, what you've done, your history of offended, mm. and they sentence you on that. Cause I guess that's all they've got to, to, to sentence you on. Um, I think I'd have been the same whether I'd have got two years or four years, I'd have mm. come out and wouldn't have committed crime again. But I think you also owe a due, you, 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 you're due to give the family at least some justice. Mm. And as far as they're concerned, they want like, I know my victim family absolutely hate me, rightly so. They, well, sorry? I know my the victim's of family course. absolutely hate me, rightly so. Yeah, They was like really lobbying against when I was out, they was trying everything they could to like, stop me from carrying on with my life, stop me from boxing. They just didn't want me to be, have any, and I, I didn't have an issue with them doing that. I never, um, rebu rebuked anything he said and never uh, said anything about him. I thought they're going to do that and they've been every right to. I, obviously with me, I've got a son that I need to look after. So I have to try and give him the best future. So I have to keep doing these things. I have to keep fighting and boxing. I say fighting, I mean boxing yeah. to try and give him the best future. And do you know what I mean? I still have a duty as a father, but people's like, yeah, but like you've done your time, this and that. I said, yeah, but their time's never going to be done. Like in their eyes, I've done my time and I've come out. Obviously it still sticks with me today, but they don't understand that. Do you get it? Mm. That it's that they, they've got a life sentence itself. So you have to see it from both sides of the plane. And that's why I just think I, I always try and keep as respectful as I can and try and not, not put any, um, not rub it in their faces as much as I possibly can. If, if, if there's any way to do so, obviously I have to do certain things because I have to make a living, but I have to, I always try and be respectful to the family as much as, much as they'd love me to probably die myself. Mm. I still have a, um, a duty of respect to the family to try and do you know what I mean? And how does that tie in? Because obviously, you 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 know you got this you know one punch killer identity gone to jail, and now, well, so actually you've got you know up and coming professional boxing potential you know hero. You've gone down to this you know one punch killer that's gone to jail, but then you've come out and you've continued to box. So how did you get back into boxing? How was the dynamics between the two? Yeah. How did people respond to you? I guess some people were like like not wanting to associate with you. Others were. How was it getting back in the ring? Let's talk a bit about that. Yeah. So everybody wanted to associate with me. I never had no one not wanting really? to be around me. Yeah. I thought that was strange. I thought everyone's going to they find. I guess they found the, probably the marketing behind it quite interesting. Maybe from like, a business perspective. Yeah. Like I think. I mean, like the general public, not businesses so much. I'm not, okay. I know, like when it comes to business, I've not really had anybody not want to work with me, luckily. But obviously, I've only got to a certain level. Like, huge brands might want me, would obviously want me to clean, clear my image up, which I believe I've done now. Um, but yeah, so my, my plan was to come out in my head. I'd like a, this is my dream in my head. I was going to come out, I was going to set up a charity, get back into the boxing, and like become world champion and try and teach people from my story not to basically make the mistake I did. Mm. And it didn't go like that. The British Boxing Board basically just said, no, we're not giving you your license back because you're still unlicensed. Right, okay. Um, so I was like, okay. So then I started doing unlicensed boxing and I was making a living from that. And um, what's the difference between that? It's just not professional. 
Okay, it's not bare knuckle boxing or anything then. It, it's, it's not what? It's not bare knuckle boxing. No, it's not bare knuckle like boxing. It's just boxing, but it's just, it's just not professional boxing. Right, but okay. it's still, there's still some good fighters in there. So I did that. Then I finished license like last year, the year before. And it was like, then they were just still making it hard, asking loads of questions, trying to just make it difficult. I was like, look, I've never been in trouble since. Just, but then they, they kept pushing it and prolonging it that much where I've got too old now to start a professional career. Mm. How old are you? 32. And I don't live the lifestyle. Say if I was staying ready for the years and stuff, but I didn't. I just like live like a normal person, basically. I trained here and there for a few fights. But what about in jail? You just sitting there eating noodles and bread? I just got hench in jail. I didn't train it or I didn't do no cardio. When you say hench, do you mean fat? Or do you no, mean I just muscle? got big. I just yeah, went to yeah. the gym. I just ate and just went to the gym. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, so luckily for me at the moment, I'm able to, a, the influence of boxing is really on the rise. Um, so I'm doing a lot of influence. Say influencer with. boxing. So explain a little bit about that. So that's just anybody, whether it's YouTubers, rappers, anybody with um, some kind of format, like some kind of um, status, is it? I yeah. guess. Yeah. Anybody that's known in, in the public eye for whatever reason, it could be an actor, comedian, whatever. They're just boxing each other. With that is, I'm not a bully, so I don't want to fight people that can't fight. So this is where I'm getting to another sticking point. I'm kind of too old to turn pro, but too good to find the influencer boxing. So right. I kind of hit a sticking point. Yeah. But now there's all, a lot of other boxers doing the influencer boxing. So we're talking about like the Logan Paul. The Logan Paul's, the KSI's. Sort of stuff, the, right. Yeah. So like Tommy Fury, he's um undefeated professional fighter and he's doing influencer boxing even though he's doing it with a professional record with a professional thing and fighting because jake paul's technically a professional boxer but there's a lot of uh boxers turning over to it now so that's the field i'm going into at the minute it's looking to really take off soon so why is that because you make more money and it's... it's good money in it man because boxing to get paid it's all about how many people want to see you fight and these lot of big of far bigger stars than most boxers mm. so ksi has got a bigger following and all the and and it's the younger generation that really invest in it they care they they're on social media they're like all right this guy's gonna fight this person i want to know who's gonna win and then mm. everybody's invested in it and that's where the money comes from so so how did you gain your influence or status throughout all this so yeah so somebody asked me this and i don't on someone asked me this recently on a podcast and, I, and the god's honest truth is i don't know i believe it started from obviously I sparred with a lot of the best boxers in the world. So was it happening before you went to jail? And you no. Went, no. So when I, so obviously I was known-ish, but nowhere near like what I am now compared to- A couple of to, local papers kind of thing. Yeah, just like I was known in my, I was known in Derby. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Um, but then I came out, I sparred with Tyson Fury quite a lot. And I think that he was basically saying this kid's going to be- And how did you manage to spar with Tyson Fury? But so what happened was I, me and his cousin Hugh used to spar before I went away. So obviously and my family and his family are close. So I'd come out and I'd literally been out like two weeks, three weeks. And they let me go to France for three weeks to train. Um, so I went to train with him in a training camp and I sparred with Huey out there. Huey, I cut Huey in sparring. So he couldn't spar. So then there was only another sparring partner. And I cut, and I, I think so I, I think I bashed him up and he didn't want to spar. So there's no one for me to spar. So Tyson was there training, but he wasn't sparring. So he goes, oh, I'll spar with you. So I sparred him and gave him a black eye. Then after that, I think he just was like, we, we, we kind of, we, you get respect for each other in the ring when you have it out. And I mean, him just become close from that camp. And then he went to fight Klitschko. They employed me for the sparring. So that's when I was his official sparring partner for the first time. So I sparred him for the full Klitschko fight, beats Klitschko, and then we just become friends anyway. And then like we just sparred over the years. And if I'm off the back of him, I've sparred a lot of people, but they all say this keys is going to be the next world champion as soon as he gets his license back. So I think that brought a lot of attention to me when, right. they're, when they're talking on social medias and on the Instas and stuff. And then I'm just around a lot of like people in the public, whether it's rappers, footballers, things like that. I'm just around a lot of people. So I think maybe just, I don't think I've done so much. I just think it's the people that I'm around. So maybe I'm like a tag along mm -hmm. guy. Yeah, in whatever yeah. but obviously I do have my own talent through my boxing so it's my boxing is my is my talent through boxing that basically put me in the position to be for people to be around them and they want me on podcasts and YouTube shows and stuff like I that I guess in a sense because obviously you haven't quite made it you said yourself that you didn't put your your hole into it of course you've been to prison you know you're kind of like this underdog that yeah. could blow so everyone's like attaching themselves yeah. in, in the sense that they want to get in there early and you should you know yeah, you do it and maybe so let's, let's step back into a little bit more of the uh, the deeper side of this so Obviously, someone's lost their life. You know, how did and how does that affect you in terms of the way that you think and feel around that whole scenario? So I remember when I was in jail, I even though I felt bad about it, I was very bitter because I was kind of like it was your fault. Like mm. I was kind it's of exactly like, the same thing that the the other guy that killed, that yeah, killed said actually. I was like, if you didn't give it the big and I want to fight and bring your mates, this wouldn't have happened. I told you not to do it from the start. You've put it on me. I've come around the corner. Like if you'd have just, do you know what I mean? If you'd have not started this, we wouldn't have been in this situation. It's your fault I'm in here. 
Do you know what I mean? So that's how I was for a long time. I think up until I come out of prison, to be honest. Do you think that was also a little bit maybe of a, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, do you think that's a bit of a defence as well? Facts, I was just going to say that. And it was yeah. also a defence mechanism because it's hard to look in the mirror and have an honest conversation with yourself. Very hard. Yeah, 19 years old. And yeah. Started processing that. Yeah. yeah. And it took me a while then. When I came home and I, I, it was like a gradual thing. Just I think just maturing as a person, accepting. I had a lot of flaws and even coming out, there's a lot of things I didn't still like about myself. So I had to have some hard, honest conversations with myself. And it's not an easy thing to do, man. It brought me to my knees a lot of the time. Just everything in my life, this being a big prevalent thing, but just also things, things with family, things with me as a person. And it was hard, but I just couldn't grow until I had to, I had to go through a shedding stage mentally, physically. I had to just kind of shed the old me. Mm. which I'm still in a process, it's a process anyway. But yeah, it's hard, man. It's a hard reality to live with, to know that you've taken somebody's son away from them. Like I am addicted to my son. You have me on social media. You must see how much I'm with him. I'm with him more than he's my world. And to know that I've caused that much, if he, anything happened to him, I would probably end up in a mental hospital because I wouldn't physically be able to take it. Mm. For me to have any part in putting that pain on somebody else's family, it, 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 it breaks my heart. It disgusts me and it, and I, if there's anything I could do to help or to take it back, I would, but I can't. And I know that I can't. So, and me being sorry is not going to bring their son back. But I just think, what can I do? I can't bring it back. So what's the next best thing I can do? And all I do is try and spread awareness, let people know the dangers of fighting. I just try and put good back into the world. I do a lot of charity work. I go all over the place mm. doing charity stuff. I go to schools, I speak to kids about not getting in trouble and things like this. And I just try and... Nothing I can do was ever going to bring him back. So I just do the the, the littlest, the, the the little things that are just trying to put some kind of footprint back on the world of goodness to try and stop other people from making the same mistake I did. Have you rehearsed a scenario in your head of how you wish that had played out? Like, oh, I wish I'd just literally didn't go out walked that night. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I literally wish I didn't go out that night. I just wish that when it kicked off, or even when it came to me, I just walked off. I was, but I had too much pride. Now it's happened to me a few times where people have... I've been in close, people have swung for me or they've come at me. Really? And I don't, I don't even, before, I literally was so insecure within myself, I couldn't walk away. I'm thinking, it play on my mind for days and days. People think I'm a pussy. Yeah. People think I'm scared. I'm not scared, this and that. Now, I generally don't care, even if you do think I'm a pussy, even if I am a pussy, okay? I just know, everyone has put it on me, I knock them, I just think, I've got to put you out. Yeah, like yeah. I just don't need to I could have just knocked you out or hit you what if you land on your head first of all and then it goes bad again or even if it doesn't what if I hit you and then I go back to prison there's mm. no scenario is, 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 is there's, there's nothing good's going to come with the situation or even if I hit you and I don't go back to prison and you don't die what's that going to do for me it's not it's, there's still no good come from the situation all it's proved is that I can that I'm that I'm harder than you now big deal who cares mm -hmm. I've got I'd rather go home to my son so I just wish I knew then what I knew now and I wish I was a lot more mature then, but I was just an insecure kid. That's just the thingy, it, the be all and end all of it is. And since being home, I, cause I always knew there was something a bit different with how I process information and how certain things make me feel, but I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So I think if I'd have known that at the time, it would have helped a lot because I'd have been able to work on it, but I just don't process information or feeling, my feelings might be a lot stronger, like embarrassment or neglect. A lot of things come into my, um, into my, into my emotions when certain scenarios happen. Like triggered easily. Yeah, triggered. I don't, now it doesn't happen because I know myself more, but then if someone says something, I'm not walking away. Do you get yeah, it? Yeah, things yeah. like that, whereas now, okay, I don't. I, I've also been diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder. Have you? Yeah, yeah. I think 80% of the prison population have a personality disorder. Yeah, yeah, probably. Which says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit of a deep question, but I'm, I'm sure you've asked yourself this as well. Um, if you could say anything to that guy now, if you had the opportunity to speak to him, what would you say? Uh, what can I say apart from how sorry I am? I just let him know, like, I don't, it, it's, it's not something that I just think, oh, that's it. Like my life goes on, my life doesn't go on. My life will never be going on completely because in the back of my mind, I'll always know that theirs isn't. And I just think, why did we, like, it could it could have been either way. You could have hit me and knocked me out, who knows? Like it mm -hmm. could have happened. We're just two young kids who didn't want to back down from each other. And it cost both of us our lives in a certain, in a certain aspect. It cost me my career. And I, I also had to see my family, they was broken down. They it, it ruined their lives at the time. Like there was probably embarrassed. It was all over the papers, this and that. There's having to come to court to see me, this and that. There was having to come to prison visits. So it, it affected everybody. And then to see their parents, his parents were distraught, do you know what I mean? And I, and I bet to this day, they just got such a hole in their heart. So I just say how much, how sorry I am. And in his, in, in, in his legacy, I just tried to do, put good back into the world. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? In his name, do you know what I mean? Like it, it, even though he lost his life, he's like, 
because of him uh, is the reason that I'm doing good in the world to try and help. To, do you know what I mean? So. Well, that's that's why you're here because you've turned your adversity into yeah. an asset. You know, you've got you've you've gone through this tough time. One very very bad thing has happened, but as a result, the ripple effect of that is hopefully some very very good things. I mean, even yeah. if two kids go out and don't swing punches on nights out that could have killed people, yeah. you're already in a positive. You yeah. know, but the ripple effect of those talks that you do in schools and things like that are going to be far reaching, especially when they hear the impact of, of, yeah. of what that can do. Because, yeah, you know, I didn't have any idea of, of that. No, no one taught neither me that did, either. either yeah. So you also, um, I don't know if you, I just want to ask you a question because I'm actually not sure, but I know that you have a faith now. Yeah. Is that something that you always had? Is that something that you found in jail? Is that something that came later on in life? So I was always interested in faith. I'm not from a religious family, but I always believed in God, but not religion. Um, and being in prison is the closest thing to death. You're just alive, but you're existing, but you're not really alive. Mm. You're basically in a concrete tomb anyway. And I think when you're in there, you start to question life. What's the meaning of life? But it was actually right before I'd done most of my prison sentence without researching stuff. But then towards the end, I think the last six months, I came a book across a book called A Brief Illustrated Guide to Understanding Islam. So from that, I read it. It piqued my interest more. I'd look, I'd researched Islam a bit before when I was younger. And just from that, I was amazed by what, because people have spoke to me about it before, but they just didn't really show me certain aspects of it that I didn't know. This was talking about the, the miracles of the Quran, the scientific facts, things like that. So then I started really researching it. And from that, that changed my life. And um, that definitely has a big impact on the person I am today. Um, all the good, in, all the good, a lot of them, the, most of the good in me comes from Islam mm. and it comes from my balance of life and it comes from how I see things and, Islam's the truth. Like there's no, there's no other explanation that it come from God. When you look into it with an open heart and a pure mind, it's impossible to come from anything other than God. Like it's, it's literally impossible. That's the only logical explanation. So it was hard for me to want to accept it because I just thought, ah, oh, I want to go out. I want to go drinking. I want to go clubbing. Like I miss it. The girls are this, the that. And Islam's very disciplined, but the wisdom behind everything makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, you know what? It's better to die. It's better to accept. If you believe it's the truth, then accept it and then just work on it. And that's what I did. I just thought, right, I'm going to become a Muslim and gradually just try and stop whatever sins I have or whatever bad things I do just as I get older, try and do it less and less and less. And when I first came out, I was very like soft natured for a while. Then like just this, because remember I'm away from everything. I'm just like in my own little thing. Then society started to get to me. I started to fall off track more and more and more. Started to become back a person I didn't really like after like maybe a year of being out. Then I tuned back in with myself. My son was born, that changed everything. I got closer to my age and I'm far from perfect now, but I try better every day. And now there's loads of things I used to do that I don't do. And it's mm -hmm. just, a, it's a process. Even born Muslims have to find Allah. They have to come back to him. And, so. you, and you take it seriously because when we met for the first time in Dubai, it was uh, in the middle of Ramadan and you weren't eating. Yeah, so. no, we fast, bro. Yeah, we don't, we don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't miss no fast. But even so, when I first started, I did half. I used to fast half of them, the first room. Then, then some, I would, I was like, oh, yeah, like some here, some there. But for the past four years, I say, I don't miss them. Like yeah. that's it. I just, I keep them, keep them, keep them. Um, but yeah, I was, it, it was hard, especially when I, for, for years and years, I was, I, I'm from an area where there's not many Muslims at all. So I don't I have no Muslim friends or family. So it was hard to be Muslim and, is that, is that one of the reasons you moved to Dubai because of that culture? No, it wasn't. It wasn't because it has being in Dubai definitely helps when you're a Muslim because there's a lot of people on the same path as you. But you have to have discipline, man. That's what Islam teaches. It doesn't matter if I'm in a non-Muslim country or whatever. I'm still I'm who I am, and I'm very outwardly Muslim. I'm very proud Muslim, and um, yeah, man, it's it's been a blessing in my life. A lot of good, well, all the good in my life has come from being a Muslim. So, so I'm very grateful. Let's lastly finish on Dubai. So. What's your lifestyle like now? You know, you're living in Dubai. I see you sort of pulling up in Lambos and stuff. So <laughs> this is definitely an asset of some, some of the things you've been able to create through maybe faith or, yeah. you know, just sheer, you know, determination to make sure this, you know, past event doesn't define you. Um, what's life like today? Alhamdulillah, man, I'm blessed, man. I think no matter what, I've like I've recently just come back from Gambia. I don't know if you've seen it on my Insta. And I was out there often just feeding kids and was going like driving hours into villages, yeah. And just these kids have got nothing. Like these families, they've literally just live in like the desert. They've just got like shacks. And was that a like, part of a charity? Or it's you... charity work, Spot Project. My oh. friend owns a charity called Spot Project. They do amazing stuff, man. May Allah bless them, man. Um, but that puts- What was that again? Shout it out for them. Yeah. The charity, what was it Spot called? Pro Spot Project. Spot Project. Yeah. Oh. They, they, they really do, they really do great work, man. Um, 
And I was very grateful and thankful that they, because that put everything into perspective. Like I literally come from one extreme to the other. Dubai is like the ceiling. Like every, it is the best of everything in Dubai. And I've come here and these kids are so happy and they're so grateful and they've got nothing. They literally mm. have nothing. And they've never seen TVs. They don't know about phones, this, that, the other. And they're just happy. And I just thought, you know what? No matter what happens in life, you're blessed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? If I've got, which I always have done in my whole life, even though growing up, you see how I said I was poor growing up compared to everyone else. That, I'm living like an absolute king compared to these kids. Mm. Like I had Playstations, I had clothes, there was food, there was a house. Was like, it? do you know what I mean? I was basic. I'm, I was so rich, but I didn't understand it. I would grow up in a safe place. I was like, I was basically a multi multi-millionaire without even knowing it because yeah. these kids have nothing. So yeah, life in Dubai, alhamdulillah, it's a nice life, man. You, you've you been there a lot yourself, haven't you? So you know what it's like. It's um, it's nice, man. It's hot. It's expensive, <laughs> but there's, it, there's a lot of things that are cheap. But the biggest thing I like about Dubai is obviously it's a Muslim country, which I love. And there's a lot of opportunity there. There's, and people want to help you there. They want They don't care if you're going to get past them. They were, if there's an opportunity to help you, they'll help you. Whereas in England, I think no one wants to help you if they think you're going to surpass them. Right. So I've networked a lot out there. I've got some good sponsorships. I'm a shout out, don't worry. <laughs> um, and good sponsorships, some good some good people. I've got some stuff setting up. I'm fighting out there in three weeks on Tam Khan show, Social Knockout. Social Knockout 3, this is. And yeah, man, it's just a nice style of living, man. I like it out there, man. Well, fair play for carrying on the boxing. I mean, how many years later now is it since you first got into it? Like 25 years? It's or... a lot. Do you know what it is? I was going to quit, but I just thought, you know what? I've given too much of my life to boxing to not get nothing out of it. Yeah. And I'm actually going to be fighting on the Misfits, which is like the biggest YouTuber platform, nice. um, influencer platform in September. That's on Design, so that's on like with all the proper boxing. Cool. So that's, I'm looking forward to doing that. Nice. Um, that, that's the one that like Logan Paul's. That's yeah. That's where yeah. they all fight on them. That's the biggest one. So they've right. they're gonna have me on, and hopefully, because they're probably doing... more successful from that than you ever would have been from your professional career anyway. I don't know about that, but no. <laughs> it depends what you measure success by. I right, guess okay. I think I would have definitely been a world champion if I. There's no doubt in my mind if I'd have not gone to prison and I trained like a demon, I would have been the best. But you can probably be a world champion these days and make 50 grand a year, can't you? That's the other thing. So if you're measuring it on for money, this is a lot, the money's a lot better. Unless you're like a megastar like Tyson or AJ or yeah, people yeah. like these, there's a lot of world champions that don't make a lot of money in boxing. Yeah. Whereas well, with they these- they might make it, but then they don't make it again for a year or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Whereas with these boxing, they're getting paid good money to mm. do three two minute rounds. You can't make, that's what I like about this as well, because I can still box and I don't have to train hard. <laughs> yeah. So perfect like, for you. Yeah, it's perfect. So I've been <laughs> blessed, man. I'm lucky, man. So that that's the direction I'm trying to push at the minute. I've also started a trading platform. It's about to launch soon. So if you're watching this and you're interested, then my link is in my bio to my free Telegram group. I'll be giving everyone the download there in the next week or so. Nice. So yeah, I've got a lot of stuff coming up. Nice. It's entrepreneurship. You're living a good life. You're helping people. Yeah. Um, definitely someone that's turned their adversity into an asset. And just uh, I hope there's someone that's fresh out of jail listen listens to this and goes you know what i don't have to go back yeah you don't yeah, have I to go move. forward there's so much money to be made in the world and there's so much opportunity in the world to sell yourself short sure, everybody's good at something everybody but the problem is is social media everybody wants to live like this now and they don't want to go for the struggle and work their way up mm. and they'll just do stupid things trying to get rich quick most i don't really know anybody that got rich quick and kept it everyone that i know that's made money it was a business it was a process and he had to graft mm. but nobody wants to graft everyone's got things so easy these days they just want to jump straight to the top that's not how life is yeah you have to work here man so yeah just have patience don't try and keep up with the joneses stay in your lane and you'll surpass them anyway. It's the, tor the tor tortoise in the race. If you try and mm. do stuff fast, you're going to crash anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just have to have, to have any, any building takes time to build. If you throw a building up and if you see a building get put up really quickly, you're going to think that's not safe. Yeah, yeah. So anything that happens quickly, the foundations is never normally good. So just take your time, build the foundations and you'll have something in the long run, man. You just have to be patient. And what a lot of people don't realize, and especially those people that are, you know, listening to this and are going through some extreme adversity or feel like they've done something that they can't recover from, they don't realize that they actually could be their foundations. You know, 100%. they've learned so much through that process, the resilience, the, like you said, putting yourself to your knees and having to really ask yourself some tough questions and yeah. come to some realizations. Those are things that a lot of normal people don't have the luxury of going through. Yeah. So they're riddled with these, you know, limiting beliefs or, 100%. you know, lack of confidence their entire life because they haven't had a real rock bottom moment to be able to reflect that back to them to fix it. Exactly. So, what a lot of people don't realize if they've had shit in their life, they're actually at an advantage. Because they've got so much, they've got so much experience that other people haven't got. Yeah. And they've been through things. And you, 
when you go through certain places, especially being in Jew, you see everyone from all walks of life. Mm. So and but just being around people, man, just use it to your advantage, man. Remember that pain that you had when you was when life was shit. Use that as fuel. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than there's nothing better than taking a pain as fire because then you'll it'll take you a lot further. Some people they don't really have that. You'll see it in boxing matches a lot. Funny enough, you'll see two people and one might be more talented than the other. Might be more fit, but when the fight gets tough, you can see some. This geezer just been for a bit too much more than you. That's why he's got more fire yeah, in his belly. He's got more dog in him, and you can just see. Yeah, and you think where's that grit come from? He's had a bad. He's had tough things happen in his life, mm. and it's like a, it's like a refusal to quit. Like there's no quitting me. It's a mindset thing, isn't it? I think uh, Tyson, obviously, you know him, Tyson Fury. He, uh, I was listening to him once tell a story about he was in uh, in the sauna. sauna with Klitschko and he was like, no matter what, what? I ain't getting out. Do you know what? Apparently he was known for being the best. With, the best. He, he, no one could beat him, but he was like, I'm going to fucking die in here if I have to. 100%. <laughs> it's all I about that. the mindset, right? And literally after his last fight with Wilder, I was I went. To, he must have been back, I think, maybe three, three days after his fight with Wilder. I'd gone up to see him at his house in Morecambe and we'd gone to the spa and we're sat in the sauna and I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm not getting out first. And he just, he could have definitely outdone me. He just wasn't in the mood. He was like, well, I'm not doing it. Did they say, yeah, yeah. I just never let him forget. I was like, yeah, well, I'll beat you in the sauna. And I was, was, you, the was you going to go for it? Or was yeah, you I was just... going to go for yeah. it. I'd beat it. I said, he got out. I said, no, I'm not playing these games with you today. That's so, the moment when he did it once. Yeah, yeah I've, got, I've got him on. I've got him on camera if he tries to deny it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, look, you mentioned your sponsors and all that sort of stuff. And if people want to find you, do a little shout out, like, yeah, so I'd like to big up my sponsor, uh, Shiba Saga, they're a crypto company. They're literally just about to start a new crypto coin. I personally don't know much about crypto. I'm not into that stuff. But what I do know is all my friends in Dubai that are millionaires from crypto have all invested heavy into this coin. And a lot of rich people that I know in Dubai have all invested heavy into this coin. I believe in it so much so that whatever they pay me, every time I get paid, half of it goes straight into the... I say I invest half of everything into my coin. So that's the next one to blow, so go on my page or get at Shiba Saga crypto coin before it's too late. It's actually a public preset on now. It's going to launch, I think, at the end of the month. So get it while you can. Also, my boy Ryan, he owns a company called Change. They help people with um, e-commerce and stuff. And his community is amazing. Like what he does, I've seen him turn so many people's ideas into million pound businesses. So he's very good at what he does. So shout out my boy Ryan, go on my page. And you'll see loads of uh, posts of me and him on there. Go and message him if you need anything like that. And I want to shout out Baytree cars. Um, I only ever buy my cars from Baytree. Like, if you ever see me driving a car, I buy it from Baytree. They're the only place I'll go to that have got the best customer service. Anything, if there's anything wrong with a the car, they'll sort it out. If there's anything that you need, if there's anything you want to change, they're just perfect for everything, man. So big up Baytree cars, man. So they're my sponsors. And if you want to find me, I'm Timey Chill Official on Instagram. Did I get a bit slower? Just so they can catch that. <laughs> That's the fast one. I'm Ty Mitchell Official there you go. on most of my social media platforms. So yeah. Nice. Well, thank you very much for Thanks joining for me today me. in London, a uh, little bit of an escape from Dubai. And yeah. it's been a pleasure and well done for turning your adversity into an asset. And thank, thank you, you everybody, for listening. It's been Cheers, a pleasure. Bro. Thank you.